Well, our next speaker is Michal Michaeli. Michal is a founder and managing a partner at Eva Ventures. She will talk about women in tech, startups, coding, and does it even matter? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Shani, for the great introduction. It's a great, really, it's an amazing conference, and um, I'm very impressed with it. And as I said, I'm very happy to be the least geeky person here, I think. At least that's the title I took. And as Shani said, I founded and manage an investment body that invests in exceptional Israeli startups that have diverse teams, that have at least one woman in the founding team. And during my career in the high-tech industry and when I decided to um, found Eva Ventures, I often found myself talking about the high-tech in Israel or the startup scene. And you know, probably those figures that I very happy uh, in many times, I'm very happy to brag about. And we all know all the good and shiny outlook that the Israeli startup scene is really, really usually um, hold. And, but what the numbers doesn't really say is that it's relevant for a very, very small part of the Israeli population and the Israeli industry in whole. And to actually what you usually uh, see when you meet an entrepreneur or a high-tech geek is this. Now take a minute and think that when you think of our, one of our shining diamonds, one of our leading industries, and many of the people that compose it are young. Thank you. <laughs> young, usually in the mid-30s, male. White male, as they say in American, but it's also relevant because most of them are from Ashkenazi descendant, um, live in Tel Aviv or around it, centered in, the, centered in Israel, very well educated, as you can see from the numbers. And many of them have the military background, which is relevant from Shmoni Matayim, from Amram, from all the relevant technical units. So it's actually more of the same in a way. And why did I say white male? Because it doesn't include so many of the Israeli um, society. It does include Arabs, which, is, which are less than 1% of the entrepreneurs. It does include Haredim, Orthodox Jews, which are also embarking on the, on the uh, single percentage. And it even excludes women. And I want to remind you, we are over 50% of the population. And the numbers vary usually some say up to 10% of the entrepreneurs are women, but I take the lower number, which are 7%. This is what I know from my work in the last uh, few years. And the whole area of all, the whole ecosystem and the whole impact of the startup, startup um, nation, or the, as we want to see it as a high-tech nation, is very well limited to the, between 9 to 12% of the population of its workforce, of its GDP, and it's not yet one of our leading engines. Now, when you look, it's even more, um, even more um, shown when you look at the percentage that these population take, in the, and you have 20 and a little more than that percent of Arab in population. Many of the students, mainly now in the Technion, but still, you have a lot of graduates uh, that are Arab now, and yet it all translates to a very low representation in the, in the um, ecosystem and the industry. And just as well in the Orthodox, which are now, of course, shifting and starting to move a little bit. But mainly, it, in the beginning, in a way, it amazed me how much it is so uh, clear, the absence of women. And it's going through all through the industry, starting with startups and in the big companies as well, and in the academia, of course. But as the, biggest, the bigger the chair is, at least women you see there. And we talk about less than 30% of the general um, personnel in high tech, and that usually includes not only the technical employees, but also the supporting um, uh, roles around it. And it, of course, shrinks as high as you climb and leads only to less than 4% of the CEOs. Now, it's not 
that it's very, very, very unique to the high tech. Let's face it, in most of the industries in Israel, you don't see a lot of women in the management roles. And I know you'll say, yes, the banks. True, there is the finance sector. I think it's the only one in Israel who has considerably bigger numbers, big, bigger representation of Israeli in the leading roles. But yet, when you see in their boards, you see again the same pictures. And globally, it's not something that is so unique. And yet, one would wonder why an industry that is considered to be much more advanced, maybe democratic, maybe liberal, would still keep the same um, constraint and leave women outside of it. Well, actually, when we try to see the high-tech as the equal opportunist arena, you see that it's not really. Because as I showed you in the first, one of the first slides, if the role model if, is that guy, is this is the cut that everybody has to go through, where does it leave the others that doesn't really fit into it? And that's why, why while we want to think of ourselves as so liberal and democratic and advanced, we're just like the others in that sense, other uh, markets. Now, when coming to really explore the subject and see why there aren't so many women as entrepreneur, not enough in high tech, not enough in STEM, and specifically I talk about entrepreneurship because this is what I focus on and work with all the time, but it mostly reflects to all the other um, jobs or uh, aspects of the industry, even though um, sometimes it varies when you have a specific effort. And you see that it starts with all of these barriers that pile up. And I decided to focus on the funding, but it starts very early. It starts with the culture and the social discrimination, actually, that we do with boys and girls. We all know this. Every shop, every um, toy store, store has the pink and the blue sides, of course, clothes. And it actually leads, there are very funny, in a way, um, research that shows that girls that have more pink accessories, toys, and clothes do less, do not, not, do, not do it as, as well in a competence test. Just so you know, next time you buy your, girl, your daughter, your sister, something pink, think of that. Now, it wasn't always like that. It's not that long ago that Lego, for example, was a game for boys and girls, and it had, in a, in a way, gender-blind um, uh, colors, which it still does, but now it's sold under um, pink slash blue uh, packages, mostly to increase uh, the uh, profitability. But it's not only in games, it's also in classes, when teachers, and there's so many research to show that even teachers, which more, most of them are female, tend to support more um, boys when they try, when they want to um, answer, for example, things that they're not sure of, and put down the, uh, the girls that want, they are not sure. Also, they encourage the guys to study STEM. They encourage them to um, answer better. And also, there's a lot of research going all the way to, high, to, um, sorry, to the universities that shows that if you present the same paper under a female or a male name, you get different grades. These all also add up to the fact that we don't usually raise our daughter to be entrepreneurs, to dare, to try, to do things boldly in that lens. We try to usually tell them, don't, don't climb that tree, don't try to go there, you'll be hurt, you'll be dirty, you, all these things that actually box them in, and really some of them at least, of course not, are um, then are uh, not going that way later. Now the lack of role models. Luckily, and I really want to applaud the organizer, that they brought so many women, also as audience, but as speakers as well. It's very rare. You don't see a lot of role models like Kira Odinsky, or like others that I will show you later, that had startups, that has successful companies, that may, had exits, that work and achieve amazing um, goals. It's usually something that is first not very targeted by the media. Kira is exceptional because she's quite known and she's been out there a lot. But 
how many people in Israel know Michal Tzur, for example, from Kaltura, who had the exit in theater? Do you know her? Have you heard of her? For example, and so many others that really succeeded and really doing amazing, amazing things and people really don't know them. And there's a very famous saying, you can't see, you can't be who you can see. And that's true. When you don't see others in that path, it of course weakens your uh, want to go that way. Even this programmer Barbie <laughs> that was uh, released a few years back, it took them a while. Now networking, excuse me, is a very, very important part of every business interaction. It's not specific to the high tech, it's not specific to, uh, of course, uh, not even fundraising and everything, but it's in the core of everything. And um, research showed that women network differently. Usually we don't make network connections, we make friends. And this is something that you might feel in a way um, outrage. I know that some women, when I tell them that, really oppose it and say, what should do? But if you think that if you need to, somebody comes to you and says, can you please recommend a computer a programmer? And when you think of all your contacts and people you did reserve with or study in university, and you said, ah, oh, this is a good guy, and you can give, of course, immediately a few names. But if it's somebody that you're close with, if something that you are sharing your secrets and thoughts, you will think twice because you don't want if something is not right in the way that hap uh, what happened there will reflect on you as well. And also, you take sometimes into consideration things that are not relevant. You might say, "Well, my friend now she's going through a divorce. Uh, it's maybe it's not a good time for her to look for another job or something." So you make their calculation for them, and it happens only when you're close to people people. And that's actually what we do as women, if, and again, it's not present. And it's very easy to change only by pointing to the issue and working on it. And it's also harder for women to just get to an event like that, get to the uh, main hall and start talking to people. That's also a matter that is very cultural, but also is man it's manageable in the way that you just have to teach the small ways to start the conversation, and it really helps with the networking for later. Another thing that adds up usually is the fact that we all, human, really work in patterns. If you think for a minute, most of us have the same friends, friends that grew up in the same, around, same surrounding as we, studies in the same um, faculties, do the same work, or come from the same origin, really, most of us doesn't really have a very, very uh, circles around us. And it's just a ba basic human uh, treat. But we have to acknowledge the fact that it helps us see the world in a specific way. And the fact that we work in patterns really block us from seeing other things. And that's what usually one of the, all, all of the, sorry, um, entrepreneurs, the women entrepreneurs encounter because those patterns cause the VC industry, at least, to work very, very narrow, and also the high-tech industry uh, later. But that's why one of the reasons that very few of the money in the industry come to those entrepreneurs. I, I agree, we started with that, that there aren't, very, there aren't a lot of them, but still, even those they are, are having much harder time raising money. And very few VCs and investment bodies have women in them. Now, again, when you go and see the results that they have, first of all, the diverse VCs do better and manage to usually not get into horrible catastrophes later in the way. And also, they invest in more diverse teams, the ones that already have women investors in. And usually most of when an uh, entrepreneur goes to see one of the Israeli VCs, but it's also in America very similar. In that sense, I can tell you that in all the criteria and all the data is very, very similar. Usually this is what they see and this, for example, when you do see here two women, one in Pitango and one in uh, JVP, it's relevant new, I think, in the last three or four years. 
um, they just started really bringing on some women investors. And when you see all male, all usually over 50, some of them have been an entrepreneur before, but many came from other industries. And again, they all look alike, in a sense. Now, you see that these are, an ex I'm sorry that I didn't translate this slide for those who don't understand, but you see the funnel. And you see that even if you start at 50% of the high level mathematics that are graduating from school are we girls, quite shortly you get to the fact that you have 5% of the VC investors, uh, women investors, and the number between 7 to 10% as entrepreneurs. And also in the high tech industry, when you talk about 28% that gets the undergrad degree in math and science and STEM, and then in, I think in three to five years, you find less than 10% still working in the high tech industry. So eventually, of course, they're not getting to be entrepreneur. Now, when you're starting the funding, and I'm not sure how many of you, I mean, I, I got the feeling that most of you work in a startup, but I'm not sure how many of you know the cycles of funding and fundraising. And it always starts with the nearest circles. The first money when you get from your family, friends, and lovely fools are the ones that, again, you need to be in those circles even to be able to get them. And later on, it's broadened to angels and later to microfunds and energy group like ours, uh, VCs and other ways to raise your money. But again, if all of these blocks in the, on the way are in a, in a way close to you, or at least very it's hard to get to, it leaves you in that sense. Now, how many women do we have here? Can you raise your hands for a minute? I want to try. Ooh. Looks like about 20% or maybe even a little more. Wow, that's very unusual and kudos to you. <laughs> I'm very happy to say that to the organizers and everyone. But in most of tech conferences, what you see is that. And it's the, the line to the loo, as they said. It's the only place other than soccer games or football games that you see only men stand in line. And this is actually what my, my experience was when working. In, and after all, all that I told you, I decided to change the, that. I wanted to see more entrepreneurs, more women. When I um, um, drafted, was drafted to the army, the army uh, took me to be a computer programmer in the Mamram. And I saw somebody tweeted a few days ago, don't ask the old guys about those days because they'll start telling you about Assembler and how they had to write code very hard. It was like that. And I think we started the course 30% women, finished less than 24%, and none of them is still working in the high tech industry. None, even one. And it wasn't that long ago. Now, I started thinking maybe it's just that we have to acknowledge, maybe it's a sad fact that we're not good enough Maybe there's a biological or I don't know reason, the fact that it's mostly a men's world, but specifically dominated by men. So I want to see, and there's a lot of research. It's been over 20 years, 25 years that we have startups in the States first and in Israel as well. And there's enough data to try and analyze and really get to a very conclusive ideas. And you see that it's the opposite, the diverse teams and I specifically focus on gender diversity, but it's also relevant to race and um, age and color and whatever. When you have diverse team, you have better financial results. If it's return on your money, better sales, better uh, returns on the equity, really, it's quite across the board. And even more so, those teams are more efficient in sense of they bring more value to the team. Also capital efficient, they use the money better. And when you know in startups, mostly in the beginning, but even later, you have to make every dollar counts. You have it usually what determines if you get to the next milestone or not. It brings you better results and it even 
showed that those teams handle the changes and the, all the crises the startup life really brings to you, they handle it better. And when you think, usually to every investor in another area, would you pr promise better results with less money, they would jump on the opportunity. True? But since it's a little bit more complicated than that, although we have such really um, evidence to the fact that we, you need diversity, it's still. So maybe it doesn't matter. As, as we said, maybe it's great that we can have it, but not. Well, first of all, we can start with a very high level of what we want our industry, our country to be, at least from my perspective, and I hope you all share it, that we want it to be something that is much more inclusive. And the fact that people, not only in the Tel Aviv area, that belong to a certain class and race and gender, would enjoy the high tech and its benefits, but also to include more of the, of the country so they can really be part of it and enjoy it, and also help us, help all of us, build it better. Now also, they talk all the time about the shortage in engineers and programmers, right? There were talks about bringing them from India, from the, all kind of the Balkan area. If we have women, we have Arabs, we have Orthodox, we have actually the manpower, the human power here. Why go and bring um, more of people outside instead of really bringing more people to work in the industry in that sense? And of course, it even raises new things. Having, as I said, the all, the, all of the same all the time, now really, what, we, what is really under, starting to be unknown is that it have effect even on the way the industry is built in a sense that even the algorithm now starts to be trained in bias. A friend of mine just showed me, sent me a symposium that was made a few days ago in New York about the fact that since, and she works in the medical area, since the algorithm are biased now and they trained on really usually the same as she, as she uh, managed uh, research that was done on Pfizer workers. And it came back with the idea that to be successful, you need to be a male, 45 to 50, and from, with a certain criteria. So the algorithm is now trying to understand what we are actually giving it to, to him, and just as well on the finance world. If it's done on Goldman Sachs workers, it would give the same ideas. So we will actually perpetuate that for further work. And it's frightening because we, were, we are using those models and those algorithms for so many things now. So it's actually that the fact that we are shaping the rest of the way at the same time. Now, I don't want to leave you just hanging there, gloomy and thinking everything is horrible, because there is some room for cautious optimism, as much as I like to see it that way with my um, pink spectacles. Um, but things are starting to change. I managed, I, um, I talked earlier a little bit about Michal Tzu, Dr. Michal Tzu, of course, from Cultura, who had a great exit with Naftali Bennett, who is more known about it in Sayota, and now manages one of the founders and managers of, of Cultura, who raised, I think, $150 million already. The video, we had Kira Radinsky here, well, again, a shining example. There's Hanit Vitos, there's Hilao Vilbrenner, there's a lot of women, I don't know if you know any of them. Some of them, they're all really amazing and exceptional, but they're not exceptional in the sense that they did it, just like so many other men. And you see that the number of startups is rising. True, back in the 90s it was really, really, really scarce. But still, if you, six, you see 600 in five years, when you know that every year 700 new startups are emerging, you see that we still have a lot, a lot of a way to go. Another thing that is very uh, happening, oh, and I forgot I wanted to add the Jungle Girls to here, but all these organizations and um, groups that are arising, and like She Codes and you know, Rail Girls and Girls in Tech and all the others, not specifically only in coding, also for uh, like entrepreneuring, also for managing, that give the envelope many, many times and help those women that started the business and 
did get into the ecosystem, overcome the barriers and the difficulties that they encounter. Uh, the fact that the, the word is out, I mean, the, there's a lot of talk about, about it. And true, sometimes it makes me at least feel that it's mostly what's happening, that they're talking about it and not as much doing about it as it should. Oops. But, Elda, can. But it's also important, I think, because we have to have the talk about the, the fact that we do not have enough women, even the fact, I know it makes definitely, pro and I believe some of you feel uncomfortable, it's not as an ex accusation. In the fact, we all have to um, be part of changing that. Um, and we have more women investors in America. There are a few already, a few funds that are diversity focused women diversity, but not only, like Aspect, who took two of the leading um, investors in the Silicon Valley and formed the new VC that raised by now, I think, $250 million to invest and investing in uh, diverse teams. And there are many angel groups and other forms that are forming to invest in gender diverse teams. Also, many accelerators and programs in this sphere that are supporting the entrepreneurs and helping them. Um, the whole issue of equity crowdfunding is also starting to get an angle that can find another way to invest in diverse teams and the fact that there are, invest that there are um, um, entrepreneurs that became now super angel, as we, as we call it, the one that comes with a, an, a different angle and help others. Now, what can we do? The acknowledge the situation, I mean, as I already said, we have to talk about it. First of all, things have to be in our uh, mind and in our, uh, in order to really address it. And it's really important for me to uh, convey to you the idea that it's not, again, it's not against men in all way, in any way. It's the fact that we have all to to um, come together and change a problem in the industry. And specifically to the women, women here, it's help, I find it helping, the fact that you understand that it's not about you. It's not specifically about you. If you're, um, get, it's, if it's harder for you to do certain things, yes, of course, we all, it's not an easy path when we all have to be a part of it. But still, sometimes it's because you're born or <laughs> raised in a certain way. So it helps really to take some of the edge off in that sense. And I said, even bringing the elephant in the room and talking about it, many times showed in research that it lowers the bias, the inherent bias that we have in, in us. Um, even the fact that people and I gave a few ways, people came to me and asked, and I gave them a few ways to address the subject. Even in a casual um, small talk in the beginning, sometimes it lowers really the bias, and people get acknowledge the fact that it is there. So it helps, and it's important to put the things out in the open. Now, see uh, the thing that is finding the, uh, the way that really helps really help you and work for you. You're different. You're shining in the crowd. A major VC gets thousands of requests and hundreds of startups every time. The ones that have diverse team are much more visible. If you do get to get there and do your pitch, they remember you much better. So you have to find the good in anything. And as I said before, it's important to network, network, and network. Men, women, everywhere. But for the women, that are looking, it's important even to remember, just to keep it in mind, and when you enter the place and that work in networking, we're not here to have new friends and to feel better with ourselves. We just, it's, it's important, again, to have it in, in the right mindset and um, just form this network that we need. It's sometimes easier to start with other women. If you do find other women in the room, start with them and then you know, power in numbers. You feel better when you do have some reinforcement. And use all the research that are there. 
all those programmers, all, all those are networking and mentoring events, and there are a lot, really. And take advantage of all the help you can get because it's a long and hard way. And also, remember to promote other women. It's true for both, because even us as women, when usually when somebody asks about a, refer a referral or recommendation, we first think, and it's, I don't, I'm not sure even there's an explanation, we sh usually think of men. And if we train ourselves to start with thinking of all the great women we know around, because we know there's a bias and we know we have to try and balance it in a way, you'll be very surprised to, f to find out that you will find amazing women that you really want to promote and you really want to help. Just have to remember it and st uh, just start with that for a minute. Now, that is, this is a message of, oops, to the guys. And these are evidence from true and real things that women came they brought um, to this forum that I uh, so don't be that guy. Remember, in effect, that you can really help and support other women, and it's in our own, in our own best interest for the industry to be diverse. Don't be the guy that mansplain, that belittle, that harass, and we won't go there. Because remember, it's a, all, all of our interests. Thank you. Questions? Yes. So she asked why, though the industry is 25 years older or so, only that we still do, we still, and let me translate you, we see so little change yet, and there are still not many women. So as I explained, the barriers are still there. And the fact that it's even talked about, it's only about the last four or five years out of it. And I think what we can see already is that when we want to do change and we focus real efforts, like the Technion, for example, did with the Arab community. They, for the last four or five years, I think they did a very organized recruitment process that targeted um, really good um, alumni from schools and they have now I think over 30 percent of their students that started this year are Arabs 50 percent of them are women of Arab women so there are steps to be done of course I wish there were government um, planning to do and there are things to do in the municipal and the government level but it still takes time and it's still rattling a boat in a rattling system it takes time, unfortunately, but eventually we'll get there. I think um, he asked, I don't know if everybody asked, uh, heard about paternity, paternity leave, uh, paternity leave if it helps uh, increase diversity. I know that the, all the research shows it does, and not specifically in the high tech, it's relevant for all the modern workforce. And I think you can uh, see that it very uh, intentionally, I didn't go to the family life balance or harassment, because this is something that every industry suffers from. It's not relevant specifically to our industry. That's why I didn't go. Of course, they, I'm, I'm convinced and I know that there's a lot of work to be done in that sense that, of course, include much more the paternity leave and other um, rules or even uh, customs that will help as long as women to remain in the workforce when they have the support. But it's not specifically relevant to the high tech. In that sense, it happens everywhere, so. It's very difficult to go from an idea to a business, no matter what gender you are. Do um, you have uh, special advisory groups that will allow women to come with their idea which they don't really know how to take to the next level and be able to connect them with the right people in order to promote that up? Yes, that's why, um, that's why I said that there are now so many, specifically it's not different from any other entrepreneur that have their idea and want to go through the, um, all, the, all the way. And that's why, for example, I mentor in three program mentoring programs, the accelerators, 
and programs. And usually I work with mixed and diverse teams. And my last experience in the A200 accelerator was that for some reason I fell in love with a group that was consist with three young men. Very, very, I told them they were just, you know, the playbook. They were between 24 and 26, just got out of the military of 8200. 80, and when I asked them why did they um, start their startup, they said, this is what you do. You finish the army and you start a startup. This is what everybody does. So it took me a while, really, and to put aside all my uh, experience, which usually it's not a good enough reason for a startup to be successful. And of course, I wish them all the best. But it's even, that's why I'm saying it's, you see the difference. And that's why you have so many now, you have so many programs that really help and focus specifically women. And I'm saying some of us are strong enough or have enough support or enough just want it bad enough to go through the, um, the same way as, other, as men as, and others. But some of us need those specific help and programs just even to lower their fears and help them start it in, a little bit stronger. So if a, just as a follow-up, if, if a woman had a, a great idea for a software program or something, uh, is there a place she would go to to talk to somebody and say, what can I do to make this into a business? There's a few. Even, and I think I showed a few of them. Just, and you can see, oops, yeah, here. Even, for example, the Women Founding Forum, who started two investors, who actually is a, like a very light accelerators that take women CEOs, they have ideas. But they also, many of them give office hours. We can just come and um, consult and ask. And of course, many of the women in the team, you can really easily go to an approach and they'll meet you and really be happy to discuss it and help in any way. Um, in order to achieve uh, having more women in, uh, in high-tech companies, there usually needs to be uh, women who want to be in high-tech companies. And nowadays, there's been lots of research done on uh, high school students that want to you know, choose what to study in high school. Uh, and simply less women want to study uh, computer science, for example, uh, because it appears less sexy or less interesting, mm -hmm. even though the, the pay is usually higher than other job other jobs uh, later on. What do you think about that? How do you tackle that problem? This is actually one of the issues that is, I think, the most burning and the most needs a much more systematic approach to change. Because it's not, not relevant to everything else that is happening around them. The fact that they see that the teacher usually not really... Even um, I have a very good friend that have twins. They're now, I think, 15. But when they were going to uh, middle school, they are both um, considered to be gifted. And the boy went to a gifted class or school, and the girl didn't want to, and they let her go. And I was furious, because it was so obvious that only because she was a girl, they let her actually not be in this place. And she said, it's not considered to be cool. I don't want to be this geek. I don't want to study math and physics more than I have to. Not because she wasn't good at it and she didn't like it, because it's not considered to be. But this really requires a much more broader um, solution. You have to, it's not enough even to come from a strong home like that home was and to see those. And we have, she has to see more role models but it also has to come with the support from the school, from actually working even with the teachers to lower their bias and help them encourage their girls, it helps usually. And you know where you see it? You see it in uh, the religious, um, even, when you see that they have better, um, high, better uh, rates of women that uh, study the uh, five points, Mathematica. Uh, they have better, um, because they don't have to match themselves to boys. They feel much um, safer there. So I'm not for segregation, but it's one of the solutions that is being tested. Yes? Bokav? Um, Importing? For where? We talk about values in India, for example. In the same way, do you think that specifically focusing on increasing diversity, for example, in women in particular, by finding talented uh, women in these countries? I mean, I do understand, of course, the priority would be the Israeli community startup, but do you think this would be 
It's an interesting idea. Actually, I never consider it. But I'm not sure, at least I know that, for example, in the United States, you have very similar rates of women working as engineers. So where will we bring them from in that sense? They're in shortage everywhere. So, but it's an interesting concept. Odmichu? <laughs> Michu? Sorry, it's the light. Yes, of course. Hi. Um, I was, you mentioned crowdfunding, and I was wondering if uh, you've seen similar or different tasks within, like, you know, the crowdfunding stuff. It's the equity crowdfunding, which is a bit different from Kickstarter and such. But yes, because I see it as um, something that started after the one of, after some of them um, were much more, a little bit more mature. They usually started like white label for women-owned uh, startups. I don't remember the name. I'll show it later. But even here in the industry, everybody knows our crowd. So our crowd wanted to start with their. Um, White la in, in, in a sense, white label, women-owned startups to invest, though it was actually part of the same system. Because they use it as a, in, a, in a way in marketing advantage, but still, I welcome every solution that helps. Can you talk a bit about the situation in the army in terms of whether they apply any corrective measures and maybe the fact that I think they serve less? Does that take a... It's funny because when I started raising money, I went mostly to United States and they said, many people there said, well, really, is it the same in Israel? Because you do also girls want to go to the army. And they thought it gives you really a better, uh, a better leverage. But no, the army is actually one of the main tools that um, perpetuate this, um, the very low levels, at least until a few years ago. Um, A200, when you see the technical um, parts there, they had less than 10% women, and uh, they're working very hard to diversify their um, actual pipeline. Also, they're, they're going to the periphery cities, and also they're targeting uh, girls that study to diversify it, but it's only one unit. As, a, as much as I know, they're not doing enough. They could do much more, because this is actually really one of the best places to um, put focus and then get results in quite a short time. Uh, and also about, I, I don't, I'm not sure that it's true already, as far as I understand now, when you serve, uh, you serve according to the role. If you're doing a specific role, you do boys and girls at the same time. So they m might do the course before or they, they play with it, but as far as I know now, as part of bringing and opening more position in the army in general for, for girls, they, um, you have to serve the same time as men. So that, that's not a problem, but they, of course, they have, they should do much more. Yes? It's a very interesting question. Um, I'm sorry, uh, he asked, he said that under the title diversity, many companies now try to get cheap labor, like the Haredi, like the Haredi women, mostly. And I have a very mixed feeling about the subject, so I'm not sure I'm the one to, to answer specifically to the cheap labor. But as much as I can tell you, I didn't see that really going to the VC world yet. The fact that not investing or, I don't know, um, estimating companies lower because I don't think there's enough now to see that. I hope we won't see it any, any time. But an interesting thing that I just read a few days ago is that they're starting to say now when they're, they have a little bit more of women, programmer, for example, they said that they're starting to see a decrease in the paying for front end programmers because there are more women programmers there. So I, I hope it's, it won't get there, but I don't see yet that this impact on the VC world, it's still so rare. <laughs>